this week's uh, known as Shabbos Shira. It's the uh, Shabbos of the, of the song. It's uh, in the Shalach, it's as Yasher. There's a funny uh, anecdote that I, I heard. Is that a uh, naming of the on Shabbos of the girl that uh, it was Parshas B'Shalach and they named the girl Shira. And, uh, Shira means to sing, but it's a nice. Uh, so there is one of the gedolim in uh, Eretz Yisrael, son of the stipler, was a great man. who was a uh, brother-in-law of the Chazanish. His son, Chaim uh, Kanievsky, people in the Nebrak, they go to him and they. His big thing is names. He gets people to change their kids' names when they're not having mazel and certain things. His big thing is that names have to be named after, they have to be found in the Torah. And uh, so very often, if you ask, you know, I'm having a problem with the shidduch, I'm having a problem with the, what's your daughter's name, is it Shira or not? And make some people change, I know people have changed their name, like a 24 year old girl, 25 year old. You know, he feels very strongly that there's a certain mazel contained in names and it has to be, you know. So, uh, he, uh, so someone told me the story that, some, that they went to him and they said, yes, my daughter's name is Shira. You know, why, why do you name her Shira? Well, she was born Parsha Shira. That's, she was born. So he said, he says, she's lucky, she, he said to her, she's lucky she wasn't born Parsha's para. He said, you know, but that was the, uh, <laughs> that's the line that he said to, uh, you know, but um, just an interesting thing. I mean, he thinks, thinks, I'll just tell you anecdotally, I mean, I, about a year and a half ago, I went to Israel with a mission. We went with a, uh, it was called Yachakala. We took about 30, 40 men. Uh, the Istrans put it together with through Shared Sedek, people from the whole community went. And um, there was a fellow, one of the guys that went along, that were having problems, uh, fertility, fertility issues. They went in. You can't get into it. It's very hard to get in, and you have to. And he like doesn't have time. Uh, yeah. He doesn't even like, you know, even to have a conversation is very hard because literally thousands of people every day are coming through there. He's like, he says, Bua. You walk through Bua. He doesn't even say the word, Brach of And it's like, it, it literally, you walk by, you know, it gives a blessing. It's like, it's, uh, so somebody went in, they were having problems, and he forced his way in. He was able to work it out, and, uh, and he gave him a brocha that his wife should have, and uh, within three, four months, she got pregnant with twins. You know, it was like, uh, but uh, there, is, there is something there. Um, anyway, so this week is Shabbat Shira Parshas B'Shalach. I want to share with you an idea that I had, I think, has tremendous, tremendous implications for us as a community, for uh, um, raising children. I'll show you the question. I believe that uh, Commentaries have addressed this as well, and there, I believe I saw this written somewhere, this idea. I don't remember exactly, but um, let, me tell you, let me tell you the part, and then... Uh, so this week is, 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 is Bashalaf. next week is Yisro, and I'll tell you in a moment, this could be used in a, an idea for Yisro or B'Shalach, either way. But we know that next week's parish of Yisro get the Torah. We receive the Torah. 
And one of the most poignant statements that are made by Kabbalah Satora when they come to her on the third month, Bachodesh Ashlishi, after the third month after leaving Egypt, they arrived in the Sinai Desert. Vayisum Rafidim, and they traveled from a place known as Rafidim, Vayavo Midbar Sinai, Vayachanu Bamidbar, they encamped in the desert, Vayichan Sham Yisrael Neged Ahar. And Yisrael encamped there opposite the mountain. So Rashi is bothered by it says they encamped in the Midbar and there it says in the plural Vayachanu. Right? Vayachanu is encamp in the plural they collectively the Jewish people encamped in the, in the desert. And then when it talks about when they came to encamp by the mountain where they're about to get the Torah, there it says, Vayichan Sham Yisrael Neged Ahar. That Yisrael encamped, Vayichan is in the singular. All right? So the question, obviously, is why? Why is it switching to singular? There's such a thing as a compound noun, and sometimes you use a singular term but we just used, in the same verse, we said in the plural that they came to the Midbar, Vayachanu. So it should say, when they encamped by the mountain, it should say Vayachanu. Why is it switched to the singular Vayichan? So Rashi says like this, a famous, famous uh, concept. So Rashi says that Vayichan Sham Yisroel, Keish Echad Belev Echad, as one man with one heart. That's why it's in the singular. So Rashi keeps going, everyone says that remembers the first part, but the second part. Aval Shar Kol Achanuyot Betarumot Umachloket. This was the one time they were able to attain peace and harmony when they received the Torah. But all the other times they encamped, there was always fighting. So the way the Mepharshim explain it is that Torah unites, concept of unity, coming together, and this is such an unbelievable level that Jew, the Jewish people received at Har Sinai, they were ish echad v'lev echad. You would think that that is, you're not going to find that by any other nation, right? That's the Jewish people are able to attain that level. So let's go back to this week's parsha. Jewish Jewish people have come out of Egypt. They're there, they don't come back after three days. And Paro galvanizes his people. We discussed this last week. Let's go back, get, get our stuff. How can we, uh, and they're chasing after the Jews. They want to kill the Jews. They want to get back their stuff. Talked about exactly how he did this last week with the, but uparo hikriv. I'm reading now. This is chapter 14, verse 10. Paro was approaching. By Yisub bnei Israel is a name. The Jewish people look up. Right, they're stuck at the river at the sea now because they can't cross. So they go, now they look back, they can't go backwards because they've got the Egyptians coming towards them. Can't go forwards because they've got the Red Sea in front of them. And the Egyptians, Egypt, was 
journeying, was traveling, running after them. Noseya is also a singular verb. Egyptians, plural, should say, Ine Mitzrayim, Nosim, in the plural. But it says it in the singular. Okay, Rashi again, it's our super commentary of Chumash. He's bothered by the fact as well. Why does it say Nosea Achareim in the singular? Belevachad ki ishechad. One heart, one man. Singular. So we have to ask ourselves, we make such a big deal about the Jewish people at Har Sinai, and it's Torah, and it's unity, and it's a one-time thing, and it's such a high level that they each they reach this level of Am Echad Belev Echad, Ish Echad Belev Echad. You know, this week's Parsha, the Egyptians are getting the same level. The lowly Egyptians are able to come together, Ish Echad Belev Echad. How do we understand that? You know, if it's attainable and any nation can do it, then it's not a big deal. Why are we making a big deal, a big deal about it by our Sinai? And if it's something that only the Jews and Russians have only happened one time in history, and it, then how can we find the Egyptians are doing it over here? So, we're going to see when you learn Rashi, the brilliance of Rashi is that his brilliance is in his simplicity. You can be five years old and you can learn the Rashi, and you can be 65 years old and you can learn the Rashi, and it has meaning for both. But if you're careful in the way you read Rashi, the messages there that are, are just life, life messages, just unbelievable messages, if you're just careful in the reading. Let's look carefully at the wording. By the Egyptians, when it says Nosea Achareim, the Egyptians were traveling after them. Look at the word that Rashi says there. He wants to show that we're unified, right? He says it was Lev Echad Ke'ish Echad. One heart, like one man. So he puts one heart before the term, one man. Let's look how he does it in Parshas Yisro, when they're encamped by Harsinai. By Yichan Sham Yisrael, Ke ish echad belev echad. One man with one heart. Now if the idea is the same, why is he switching the order? If the idea is you want to show that it was a unified front, why by the Jewish people at Harsinai does he say as one man with one heart, and by the Egyptians, he says, with one heart as one man. Same idea, why are you switching the terms? Clearly, there must be a big difference. And we have to understand what the difference is. I think we have to start talking about what does it mean to be unified? What does it mean to we? We'll talk about, you know, we've got to work together, the Jewish people have to get together, Mashiach's not going to come until we can reconcile our differences. What, what exactly does it mean that we need unity? What is really, what does it mean unity? We have in Bamidbar, there's an unbelievable parsha that discusses a tremendous, tremendous fight. It was actually an insurrection, a rebellion against Moshe by Korach. Korach resented the fact that Aaron was made, Aaron, Moshe's brother, was made the Kohen Godol, and there was a cousin Elizaphan, the son of Uziel, was made in charge of the Kahat family, that's one of the sections of Levi. And Korach felt that the, that position should have been his. And that bias, that, that uh, 
upsetness, that resentment resulted in him fueling the anger of really one of the top, the top leaders of the Jewish people against Moshe, which is hard to understand because B'chai Aminu La'olam, Hashem promised Moshe that everyone will believe in you and your leadership, and yet we see that from within there was this tremendous insurrection, you know, this jealousy and ego. It's what to talk about over there. But the argument that Korach made resonates to uh, Western society today, 21st century. The argument that Korach said, he says, Kulanu Kadoshim, we're all holy. We all were at the revelation, we all stood at Har Sinai, everyone had that closeness with God. Why should there be one Kohen Gadol? Why should there be positions that are delegated to specific individuals. Let's rotate. Let everybody get a chance. Everybody, like one month you'll be the Kohen Gadol, one month you'll be the Kohen Gadol, one month you'll be the Kohen Gadol. Why are you giving, why are you making certain people on a higher level than others? We should all have the ability to do it. All right? And Moshe Rabbeinu said, no, there has to be one Kohen leader, one Kohen Gadol. There has to be, you cannot, these aren't positions that can be rotated. Right. Many of the, there's, we know that the concept of 613 mitzvot, so there, we talk about the 613 mitzvot, actually the Talmud mentions Torah Tzivalana Moshe, that uh, Torah is 611, plus the two that Moshe heard directly, that we heard with him, those are 613. The 613 mitzvot, it's not clear what the 613 are, so there are codifiers that have written what the 613 are, and there are discrepancies, Either some are a subset of others, others keep them as primary mitzvahs. But one of the, one of the uh, prohibitions in the Torah is lok tiyeket korach kadoso. You can't be like Korach and his henchmen. You can't be a person that is a Baal Machloka, someone who is a dissenter, someone who just argues, undermines the very fabric of Jewish unity. You're violating the prohibition that you're being like Korach. Lok tiyeket korach kadoso. But if you look at the arguments on, face, uh, on paper, the way we understand, who is pushing for unity? Equality, right? Equality, we're all equal, right? That's Korach. The one that's, that's looking for that, you know, that we're not equal and that it seems to be, you know, Moshe seems to be the anti-equality person, you know, the one man, one vote, that's uh, everybody is equal, you know, that, that's Korach. And yet Korach is the one, if you like Korach, you're violating a prohibition in the Torah that you're a Baal Machlokas. It's a tremendous, that's like a, a tremendous prohibition that undermines the very fabric of Jewish unity. You cannot, cannot have Machlokas, that you can't be a Baal, you can't be a Baal Machlokas, you're like Korach. So the question is, we have to understand that. What do you mean? Moshe seems to be more of the Baal then in Korach, and yet we're blaming Korach. In Pirkei Avos, we find something else very difficult. It says that, you know, so if I would ask you, is Machlokas good, is Machlokas bad? You say, Machlokas is terrible. You like Korach, you have Machlokas. Yet you read in Pirkei Avos, Ethics of Our Father, it says that if it's a Machlokas, L'Shem Shamayim, that if you have a Machlokas that is for the sake of heaven, then it's so for this time, it's going to endure. Like Hillel and Shammai, the two, four, it was done completely for the sake of heaven, it's going to endure. If a machlokas that's not L'shem Shammayim, that's with a personal agenda, with a bias, and then it's uh, Sofel is battle and it's going to be wiped out, and that's like Korach and his henchmen. But what do you see? There's a concept that a machlok is a good thing. Otherwise, why would God want it to endure? So how can machlokas be a good thing? Is dispute good? Is dispute bad? So this is a very, very important concept, and I think it's, as I said, it's something that for ourselves and in raising our own children, I think our schools, our shuls, our community,
especially in the Orthodox Jewish community, we see that we're becoming more and more polarized. In Israel, it's even worse than it is here, but it's really seeping in here as well. In Israel, you see that there's the Ashkenazi schools that don't want to take Sephardi kids, and you know, it's like, it's, the polarization is incredible what's happening. And what, what, what the problem is, is that we identify that the way we are uniting is we want everybody to be like us should look like us, sound like us, dress like us. That's how we, we're moving into those polarization, those pockets. There's like almost no room within certain areas of Orthodox Jewry today for diversity. We want everybody to be the same. That gives us a comfort level because we're threatened when we're surrounded with people that are not like us. So whether it be communities, shuls, schools, more and more we see that level of polarization happening. The mistake, other than the fact that we're raising our children to be intolerant, which is like you know, creating a next, the next generation of Jews that are not going to get along, the mistake is that we are also misunderstanding what unity amongst the Jewish people is supposed to be like. It's exactly the opposite, and that's where the story of Korach brings out. If everybody is the same, then you'll never have unity. You won't have harmony. Because that means nobody really has a place. If everyone's the same, then anybody can be replaced. You're not special. There's 600,000 people exactly like you. So what do I need you for? You know, you got a problem? So you're out of here. Somebody else will take your place. Unity can only happen where everybody has their place. It means that everybody's unique, everybody is special. Everyone has a perspective that they alone bring and nobody else can bring. So you take the example we gave of an apple. You know, you chop up the apple. Right? So... It doesn't have to be chopped up into equal parts to be able to be put back as an apple. You can chop it up in many ways, it can come back together as an apple. Unity is when you have the harmonious coexistence of things that are different. You can't have that when everything is the same. Korach was saying that everybody is holy, everybody should be able to con Godel, everyone should have the same function. That's the biggest machlokas. That is, there's no way for there to be harmony, they cannot coexist under that circumstance. We have to recognize there is somebody that's supposed to be the con Godel. There's somebody that's supposed to be the king. There's somebody that's supposed to be the plumber. Somebody's supposed to be the doctor. Somebody, there is, in order to be able to coexist in harmo- harmoniously, we need to find who we are, what our abilities are, where our place is. Then you come together and you won. But if everyone is trying to be one by doing the same thing, thinking the same way, looking the same way, talking the same, you're not going to be one. That doesn't make you one. Yes, you might act as one for a certain period of time, but intrinsically you're not one. You're just acting the same for that moment of time until until you feel threatened, and you're going to feel because there's, you're not unique, you're not bringing anything to the table. So, diversity within, again, we're talking about within the parameters of halacha. Let's talk about that for a moment. Even with the parameters, of, there's different shades of gray, there's different shades, you know, you, it's, everything can fit in, and everything, else. and that's why there is such a thing as a machlokas l'shem shamayim. You need a hillel and you need a shamai, and God wants it to endure, because there are different perspectives. In certain time, in certain uh, periods of time, this perspective will be the one that Jews need. In certain periods of time, that'll be the perspective the Jews need. But you don't want to wipe out that perspective. There are going to be times we're going to need that perspective, and we keep each other honest. You know, you can sit down and learn something on your own. You won't know it as well as you learn with somebody else. Because they challenge you. 
Re- Rebbe said that his greatest teachers were his students. He learned more from his students than he learned from even his teachers or his colleagues. They challenge you. You learn. It creates a certain objectivity in what I'm saying because I'm being challenged. You need to have diverse perspectives. That clarifies for me what I really am and who I am because I have that pers- those perspectives that challenge the very core and fabric of what I believe. So the idea uh, and that we see from Korach, that everybody being the same, everybody being equal, is the ultimate machlokas. Unity can only come where you have the different perspectives and you have the different place. Torah and getting to learning Torah gives a person a sense of who you are. Most people try to go through life trying to ignore who they are. Whether it's through substance abuse, alcohol, or whatever it is, we try to ignore who we are. We don't want to come to grips with who we actually are. But Torah allows a person to get to the sense of who you are when you are, then you know where you fit in. Then you know what's unique about you. Then you know everybody has that. There's a uniqueness to everybody. You just have to come, into, come to, into grips with what it is. Sometimes you need somebody to help you get to that point. You start feeling unique, you feel special, it builds you up. If I don't feel unique, then it's very hard to feel special. But that unity comes through that diversity, that difference of perspective. That's where there's ultimate unity. So the Machlok Hashem Shemayim, we need that. The whole our basis of halacha, the Babylonian Talmud, is, is Socratic method, is questions, answers, and all the opinions are recorded. Right? Why not just record the halacha? If you open up a Shulchan Aruch, that's the halacha, it just says this is the halacha, this is the halacha, this is the halacha. We don't see the arguments. So why do we need the arguments? Why do we spend so much time on the arguments? Because we want to see the different perspectives. The Egyptians were chasing our, after us in a unified way. Right? We see that today. You know? 1948. Arabs, even Arabs, Sunni, Shiite, they all came together. One purpose. What was the purpose? To destroy the Jews. Yesterday they're stabbing each other in the back. Today they're running together to come and destroy Jews. So you can be unified with a common purpose. You can be unified. That could bring you, it's temporary. You come together. A common purpose can bring even the enemy of my enemy is my friend. You can become to him. But that's not true unity. That means for now, in while this purpose, we have this in common, we're acting together. Right? Says Rashi, the Egyptians were running after the Jewish people. Belev Echad, with one heart, with one purpose, like one person. What made them like one person? It's only because they had that common purpose. So that's not, that's not a big chiddush. We see that today. We see every, having a common purpose creates unity as long as that purpose is there. But it's not an intrinsic unity. It's a unity that's brought about by having a common goal. In this case, they all wanted to kill the Jews and get their money back. It brings them together. What's unique at Har Sinai is there, the understanding is that we are one. We come from the same source. We are from Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. We are one. So we, now, if you're acting together in unison because you understand that you are one, you work, you're having a harmonious coexistence because you understand that we are one and we need to come together and work as one, that's the ultimate level. It's not that the goal is putting us together as one. It's the act, the understanding that we are one that's allowing us to work in a harmonious and coexistence. That's a very high level. To recognize, you know what? You're you're not my neighbor. You're not just my neighbor and we're fighting over how close the fence should be or not. We We are one. Like the way that Masila Sharm says, how can a Jew fight with another Jew? It's like one hand taking a scissors and stabbing the other hand. We're one. One hand's going to stab another hand. That understanding that we are intrinsically one, therefore we have to work together. We might have different functions. The right hand doesn't do what the left hand does. 
but we are one and allows us to work for this for an overall greater good that's by Har Sinai because there was Ki Ishechad we were like one person that allowed us to work Belev Echad with one heart but it started being one person who acts with one heart not that one heart is making us act like one person complete difference you know and we see this, and this is why I want to bring it down for ourselves. We learn this message. God gives us this message through our kids. Our kids come from us. Right? Our father, mother, same father and same mother. And kids can be completely different. There's a big problem when we try to raise our kids the same. We want the same cookie cutter mold for each one of our kids. That, that is a huge recipe for disaster. But we can understand that the fact that they're acting, you know, they act, and, and I think, I believe, again, it's my experience has been that when there's intolerance by the parents, God forces them to have diversity, a, a appreciation of diversity. And you always see these families, how is it possible they had a child that was like this? You know what? I think God sends us messages. What sense of messages that you know you have to you have to be sensitive, you have to have that tolerance. And for a parent, for a child, ultimately other families at some point unfortunately don't have it, but usually we come around. And that sensitivity, then we learn how to have sensitivity for other types of diversity as well. But that idea, that notion is that they can still be coming from one source. And they just have different, you know, positions and different, uh, I think that is such an important thing, recognizing. And, and we, it's our responsibility to help our children discover who they are. So we need to be able to start identifying with qualities that they have and what's special about them and making them feel good about what it is that they can do, that they will strive to be who they are and not to be who somebody else is. That has to come from the home. I was talking to my wife the, uh, a couple of days ago. You know, we have a very diverse school here. And there are families that have chosen to move their kids other places because they don't like the makeup of the school. You know? My wife's saying, like, you know, it doesn't bother her who's in the classroom. You know, they could find. I might not want to send or be comfortable sending my kid to somebody else's home or to send them to somebody else's party. You know? But in terms of in what's going on in the school, peers will only have the greater effect on each other is if they don't have that effect from the home. The greatest impact on a child is going to be from the home if the home allows it to have that impact. But if the home is not having that impact on the child, then the child will look for other sources. And he'll start using peers in terms of defining who he is and what he wants to do. Well, it's not easy. I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do. But the greatest impact that we can have on our children is from the home. And so therefore, the people should not be threatened by the diversity. The diversity is an opportunity to create sensitivity, tolerance, leadership. There's so many qualities that could come out in having a diverse type of school. You know, to be threatened by it, that means that you're really what you are, you're, you're threatened by it because you're not comfortable that you can do this job that you need to do with your own kids. That's really what it comes down to. And honestly, if that's the case, no matter where you put the kids, it's going to be problematic because children will always go to the lowest common, common denominator no matter what the environment they're in. And if they don't give it, they're not given, they're empowered to make the right decisions, they're invariably going to make the wrong one. So, but the point really we want to say over here is, and that's the message that I want to, you know, the idea of unity, unity is understanding that within the diversity, we can work together for the common good. That is, that is really what we strive, we strive for. We're not striving to look the same, act the same, be the same. Then we're just unified just because of our actions. That's in the midstream. It's temporary. It doesn't last. It's not true unity. True unity is understanding we are one. That means we're not to act the same. We're going to create a common good we act together for, but not because 
we are exactly the same. That is the, that's the ultimate destruction of a society, is where everybody feels that they're exactly the same as everybody else.